This video is from my course, AWS Lambda, A Practical Guide. If you enjoy this video, please check out the course link in the description section below. Hello everyone, welcome to the first section of the course. In this section, we are gonna be doing a introduction to AWS Lambda. We're gonna cover some of the high level topics, some of the high level concepts of Lambda, and then in later sections, we're gonna go into the details. So this is just kind of a gentle introduction to Lambda. So in terms of agenda of what we're gonna be talking about today, we're gonna to start with just a little bit of an overview of what is AWS Lambda. This is also going to include some historical context as well in terms of how we got you know, from the early 2000s to where we are today. And then we're going to talk about why is Lambda useful? Why is this such a hot topic these days? Why is everyone talking about Lambda? And why is it so important and such a valuable skill set for you to learn? Our next topic is going to be about some of the disadvantages. Lambda is a tool and like all tools, sometimes a tool is not suitable for a specific job. And Lambda is no different here. There's a good time and sometimes a more questionable time or a poor time to use AWS Lambda. And then finally, we're just going to look at who uses AWS Lambda. Just take a look at some of the case studies of certain companies that you may recognize that are leveraging Lambda in their day-to-day -day workflows. So I wanna jump right into it and talk about the history of AWS Lambda and just a little bit about how we came from where we were to where we are today. So in the early 2000s or so, or even before that, we had this model of a traditional company specific data center. So something that looked a little bit like this. We used to buy hardware from manufacturers, wait for it to be shipped to us, we would install our, our software on it, and then we would finally make it available for any software applications that we were running, any databases, any compute, anything that we needed in our organization. And alongside that, since we now owned this hardware, we needed to maintain it. So things like security, we had to worry about network security and ensuring only those that were supposed to have access to these machines could have access to it. You also had to worry about things like just general maintenance and hardware failure. This was a really big pain back in the day. And another big element of this is just overall cost. It was expensive to buy this stuff. It was expensive to maintain this stuff. And there was a delay in terms of when you needed hardware, when you could order order it or purchase it and when you would finally receive it. So a lot of companies had to spend quite a bit of time just doing forecasting into the next six months or one year out to see how much hardware they're going to need in the future and be able to plan for it so that they can have the right capacity at the right time. So this was the very common model that a lot of companies relied on. So fast forward this into kind of the mid to late 2000s, even you know some of the earlier years of the 2000s, uh, when we started to see this notion of cloud infrastructure or early cloud infrastructure. And AWS was a really big player in this scene with the EC2 service. So within the walls of AWS, this notion of cloud computing that we don't have to actually own this hardware now, uh, in 2006, EC2 was launched, which stands for Elastic Compute Cloud. And this was kind of a revolutionary idea at the time. In the previous model, we had all these problems with buying, maintaining, ordering, installing, all this jazz about this hardware that we needed to order. In this new model, in this cloud-based model, Amazon offered us a way through a managed service to order compute capacity or order virtual machines. And instead of needing hosting to be in our local data center, we can instead leverage Amazon's data centers and instead just rent the time that we need or rent the virtual servers for an allotted amount of time. And this was a very big deal at the time because this giant cost sink in this traditional company specific data center model just wasn't worth it. So this was kind of a paradigm shift for an organization and even for how the developers interacted with and thought of hardware ordering as a concept. So AWS EC2 was extremely popular. Even now, this is kind of the backbone service that a lot of other services are built on. Now this led to the natural progression of computing. And this is really what the focus is of this uh, course. And that's on enhanced cloud infrastructure in 2014, which was the launch date of AWS Lambda. And the primary way that Lambda is different than EC2, Lambda is still a compute service. It still offers us the ability to run and execute code, except the key difference is that with Lambda, we pay per execution. We don't pay for the physical hardware. We just pay for how many times we want to run our code. Now, as a side effect of this, this also means that during periods of very low traffic, if we're using Lambda, we don't have to pay anything. 
And during periods of high traffic, we can just be billed on a per invocation model or a per execution model. So it's much more effective from a cost perspective, but it still gives us all those benefits in terms of load balancing and the ability to scale, monitoring, so on and so forth. Everything that you would get with EC2 and beyond. So this is kind of how we got to where we were. We were traditionally using this uh, data center specific model. Now we're on to cloud computing and now we're on to pay per use cloud computing. This is the natural evolution over the past 20 years or so. All right, so that's a little bit about the history. Now I just want to talk a little bit more now about what is AWS Lambda. So we learned that it's a compute service, so a service that allows us to run our own code. And the idea with AWS Lambda is that you run code at scale without ever having to worry about servers. So if any of you have hosted an application before, maybe it's a web application or some kind of backend application with a set of APIs, you had to think about the servers that you were going to deploy this infrastructure on. You had to worry about maintaining them, about security, about logging, all these details that go into maintaining software applications. Now the idea with Lambda is that we still get the ability to do all those things, so run our code, host our APIs, do event processing, et cetera, et cetera. However, we never actually have to deploy our code onto servers. Instead, you write functions. And functions are the primary unit of Lambda. So functions are just a block of code. You can have a function that hosts a REST API. You can have a function that, you know, performs some kind of nightly backup job. You could have functions that are hundreds of lines long. You could have functions that are only 10 lines long. There's a whole bunch of reasons to use functions. Basically, any reason that you would want to write code is a reason that you can have a function. But essentially, functions are the units that we define in the context of Lambda. You create one, you update one, you modify one, you deploy one. This is the lowest level building block of Lambda. And these are useful in many, many different applications and things like I already touched on, like API hosting, also event processing, and also ad hoc or timer-based jobs that folks like DevOps may want to run, maybe a nightly database backup or something like that. So what does a typical workflow when working with AWS Lambda look like? So the first step is we need to create our function. And there's many different ways to create our function. We can either do that through the console, like we're going to see in an upcoming section here. You can also do it through infrastructure as code or even the command line interface if you want. But it all starts with creating or defining a function in AWS. From that point, you get to write and upload your code. Now there's a whole bunch of different options in terms of programming language support. So you have access to things like Python, JavaScript, C Sharp, Java, Go, Ruby, a whole bunch of other ones as well. Uh, there's really quite a laundry list, but these are some of the most common ones I would say. And there's tons of examples of just getting a Lambda set up in each of these different programming languages. And then third step is just deploying and running your function. Of course, there's many different ways to run your function. You can either just invoke it directly, you can link it to an API, you can link it to an event processor, these are some of the examples that we're going to see in some of the later sections of this course. So that's kind of the typical workflow that you would run through. So now I want to talk about why is Lambda useful? Why are so many people talking about it? Why are so many companies deciding to use Lambda as opposed to something more traditional like EC2? And it comes down to a bunch of different points. The first one is that there's no servers to manage. This means that you don't need to have specific hardware focused individuals working in your organization worrying about this physical infrastructure, maintaining it, swapping out parts, ensuring that your data centers at the right temperature, things like that. Also, as a developer, you don't have to worry about things like patching, things like security. You leverage AWS's existing security mechanisms to ensure that your Lambda function is locked down. So no servers to manage is a huge, huge bonus. The next big reason why Lambda is so attractive is auto scaling. So Lambdas can automatically scale to support very, very high levels of throughput. So from my personal experience, I've seen Lambda applications that were running at 4,000 transactions per second or 4,000 requests per second. And Lambda can very seamlessly scale itself such that if it's ever at a point where it needs to serve more traffic for your function, it can spin up more infrastructure behind the scenes. Traditionally, if we were doing this through something like EC2, we'd have to use auto scaling groups, but Lambda abstracts those concepts for us. It lets us focus more on the functionality as opposed to worrying about the minutiae of scaling our applications. 
Another really attractive reason to use Lambda is the fact that it's a pay for what you use model. In the previous models, we had to pay for this hardware. We had to rent hardware. We had to pay monthly bills or pay by the hour or pay by the minute. With Lambda, you pay per invocation. It's a much more simple model. This also means you don't need to pay the overhead of maintaining infrastructure when your software application has little or very low traffic. In terms of performance, it's very, very fast. You can tune your Lambda by adding more provision memory to it, which will speed up its performance. And just recently, AWS announced support for their new Graviton-based instance, which is a different CPU type that AWS is developing in-house. And I believe you'll see about 20 to 30% reduced costs and better performance using this new type, which is available to you now when creating your function. The fourth one, and this is the one that I really index on and think that this is probably the reason that I love Lambda the most is service integrations. From left to right there, we have DynamoDB, S3, and SNS, very common services that we can easily integrate our Lambda functions into to allow us to perform some very interesting event-driven processing. And we're gonna get into how we can leverage the diverse set of services across AWS with our Lambda functions to do some very interesting things. And lastly, it's just super easy to use. Lambda functions are easy to get going, easy to understand, easy to monitor, and debug. It just makes your life a whole lot simpler, reduces the number of moving parts so that you can focus more on your business deliverables instead of the low level details of maintaining infrastructure. So that's why Lambda is useful. I think all of these reasons contribute to why Lambda is popping off lately and becoming more and more popular. Um, many different organizations, both large and small, are deciding to use Lambda. Even AWS itself, according to Werner Vogels, the CTO of Amazon, is seeing massive, massive adoption of Lambda functions in their internal services. So it's definitely being used all across the board in the current landscape. Now, I want to talk about very briefly now, uh, kind of some of the disadvantages of using Lambda. So I found this quote on Lambda and I thought that it did a pretty good job of describing some of the trade-offs of using Lambda. And the quote goes, with AWS Lambda, you gain flexibility at the expense of control. And this is a very true point. You gain flexibility in the sense that you can rely on the scaling features of Lambda. You can rely on all these monitoring tools and the fact that it behind the scenes will spin up new nodes or new instances to handle your traffic. But you lose the low level control over your infrastructure. With Lambda, you no longer have visibility into the infrastructure itself. You have visibility into these higher level abstractions. So you're really depending on AWS behind the scenes to do what's right and function correctly. This can be a pro or a con depending on how you're looking at it. However, this is something that you should really consider if you're deciding to use Lambda. Are you focused more on the low level details of your infrastructure, of tuning them to your specific needs, or are you more interested in delivering your software quickly? These are some of the trade-offs that you need to think about. And of course, there's many more. We'll get to some of them a little bit later when we talk about Lambda Cold Start. But this just gets you thinking about whether or not you want to use Lambda in all circumstances. All right, so just to close this section out, now I just want to do a quick little um, examination of some of the different users of AWS Lambda, which you may recognize. And there's a bunch of very common names here. So companies like Netflix that use Lambda for its very popular streaming service. Uh, then there's companies like Lyft to host their backend infrastructure. Uh, companies like Udemy, where this course is probably going to be hosted on and Square Enix, very popular game development company. Also Autodesk, which is a popular software development company, which makes tools such as AutoCAD. So really, this is a very small sample, just a couple of different examples that I saw. But the point here is to show you that lots of different companies are using Lambda across a diverse set of use cases, and it's really, really becoming popular amongst many of them. So that's it for this section. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you in the next one.